So the obvious image of the Godfather is, um, everybody knows about the Godfather, you know, it's a very difficult license, I think, to start working on because you, have to, you feel like you have to treat it with such reverence. Uh, so subject matter in any field, in any game or any design can be daunting. It doesn't matter if it's your own idea and how the hell you're going to implement it or something like The Godfather where you don't want to you know, piss off you know, millions of people that really, really love that movie. Um, and of course, the whole notion of pulling strings was the symbol for The Godfather. So here's me thinking, how can I generate a lot of design processes got, going to get an entire team excited about this? knowing that the resources at the time at EA were, were really excellent. So I had a lot of good stuff to play with. So here's, um, this will give you a little bit of an idea. It's, it's one of the trailers for it. Um, this was a game that, that just bounced over the, the, start, the, the start of this current generation. So this is Xbox, just got onto Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. So it's a little bit primitive. Oh, and it's also, can children cover their ears? <laughs> it's an 18 rated, I think it's okay, but... Don Coyon. All right. Can you see that okay? Sorry, Johnny. It's just business. Give it to him. Papa? You are old enough. And the time is right. You will take your revenge. Hey, kid. Come on in. Welcome. So I'm sure you see there, uh, it's a kind of melange of things you might recognize, scenes in the movie you might have uh, sort of half recognized, Luca Brazzi, you know, uh, and um, things that we added to the experience, for better or worse. Um, so when I was working on The Godfather, uh, there was five basic areas which I was trying to figure out how to get this design started and how to generate this. There was obviously making an authentic Godfather experience, because we knew immediately from the start that we were going to have to expand the experience. This wasn't a two or three hour movie, this was a, ultimately a 50 hour uh, you know, game that we had to entertain the player for. Um, and it wasn't about New York between 1945 and 1955, it was about the Godfather New York between 1945 and 55. And then how would you construct this game where you have a game where Sonny always dies at the toll booth. He cannot live, you know, you, it just wasn't that sort of game where it had these alternate endings where you could save Sonny. That's what James Cann thought was gonna happen. Um, you had to figure out how to address that so that the player would not, for example, know that that familiar moment was coming uh, or how you would work away from it. So I found myself doing a lot, a lot of what I call topping and tailing, was taking this original content and then working around it. Um, and you'll see from some of the early drawings I did that that I'm working with this strong story spine of the actual movie, the whole movie experience from start to finish, and I'm finding all these great moments, these classic moments that you all remember, the look of Bratzi uh, in the bar, you know, uh, Tessio's betrayal, all these things, and I'm taking that story as this kind of linear path like it was in a movie, uh, and not terribly interactive, and then I'm winding all this new content and this new experience around it. Uh, obviously wanted all this to happen in a living world. This was EA's brief, you know, everyone else was doing living worlds. It was time we did one, uh, an open world game. Uh, dialogue and cinematics, uh, no expense spared at EA again, but how do we get the original people involved and how do we supplement that with the new people? And then how the hell do we share this process with everybody else? 
Uh, my process in general, and most of these drawings you'll see are mine, uh, uh, involves sharing from, from day one. You know, trying to be the catalyst for the first time you put your, well, I use a pencil and paper mostly, I'm not terribly digital uh, anymore, but um, uh, so, so the first thing I was trying to discover was how do you discover the beats or the emotional waypoints in your story? So this was the start of um, uh, what Bing Gordon at EA called totems. These are totems that the design team, uh, you know, and that in includes people from all disciplines, gather around these totems like a hot fire. They hate them, they love them, they work with them. I'll draw one every week, you know, um, and I'll take that kind of deadness of a, of a, of a computerized flowchart out of it and I'll personalize it and I'll sweat over it and I'll draw these endless 11 by 17 sheets. So if you look at the scale of this, that, that third there is about the size of a, uh, what, what's it in this country, uh, A3, 11 by 17. Um, and I ran the story spine down the middle. Uh, so you're only seeing a half of it here. So here's all the missions, the dawn is dead, which is when they thought Don Vito had been killed in the, with the oranges and they're running across the road and uh, Tom Hagen was kidnapped and all that stuff. And then onto the sides of it, you'll see all the missions and the things I'm adding and where they appear in the timeline. And this sort of thing really keeps your team uh, up to date with where you are. I remember when we designed Bond, uh, we had the story team and then we had the mission design team and I remember there was all sorts of things like we forgot a whole plot point involving a beautiful Romanian spy. So we ended up saying, well, oh, just put her in the corridor. So you actually meet her and you have your whole interaction with her in the bend of a corridor on your way to the next mission. I mean, it's, these things happen all the time. So, so as you see the narrative start to expand, uh, that's the full width of the chart and you'll see that there's a bunch of the famous characters that you know, there's new characters, and I managed to slip in a couple of Irish characters, which I was very proud of. Uh, Monk Malone and Francis Malone, who became two of my focal uh, point uh, characters. And again, I was writing the narrative from the point of view of, of the player being this non-entity who comes in and goes through the, the Mafia experience. He uh, gets promoted and, and, and becomes a made man and all that stuff. So he wasn't in the original story, obviously. Now, I'm not sure that that's always the best thing to do, and in fact, I'm really a bit anti it now. Um, but that seemed to be the popular way at the time, is to have a nobody, play a nobody, and play his life's journey. Um, so I also had to give him a supporting cast as well that was uh, unique, but obviously figure out how he interacted with Tom Hagen and. Uh, all the other famous Godfather characters. So this chart ends up like this, which if you imagine that first 11 by 17, it's pretty large. So you needed to have these giant holes of E3 for this one, of, of EA for this one. But the nice thing was it was all there. It was design process. I didn't care that I had to draw it once a week. Uh, it, it, it's quite a lot of work, but it, but it really gets that uh, design flow out there, people start to understand, but they also enjoy it because it's graphic -y and it's kind of fun and cookie and it doesn't take a lot of drawing skill. Um, so out of that, I mean, this little box where it says story missions, that's the game I wanted to make at first. I wanted to make a 12 or an 18 hour experience for The Godfather. I wanted to, I've preached a lot about what I call golf holes. If you want a current game reference, play Dishonored. It's the worst name for a game in history because it's so hard to remember when you're trying to complement it. Um, but it's a really su succinct, it's a hard word to say in a lecture, uh, short series of missions uh, connected. It's not an open world, uh, but the world itself, each of them is like a golf hole. Uh, of course, coming from Portrush, that is my connection to golf, where you have a very tangible uh, amount of information to create, right? It's a golf hole. It's not a world that spreads for miles or whatever. It has a very distinct ending. It has a destiny. It has a hole. It may be a, a dog leg. It may be a par three, whatever the imagery of it is. But the critical point is the player, the way you want people to play this, and this is where Dishonored does so well, is you want people to, you want to hand them their golf bag of clubs and let them play the way they want to play. So for me, that's you know, the kind of gameplay I really like right now is, do I want to play stealthily? Do I want to go in with my rocket launcher all guns blazing? Um, so golf holes and the, and the golf bag metaphor really locked that in for me. Um, but again, as I said, EA wanted the, the full 50 hours. 
Um, so we decided to start expanding that out into how we would open up this world, uh, what sort of other mafia activities are connected, what could we do in New York, how the hell are we going to get to LA for one mission involving a, a horse's head that really you can't leave out. Um, and so basically all the designs and things I'm thinking about making at this point are a whole mixture of all this kind of existing Godfather lore and uh, uh, new features that may be, you know, the sort of things in Grand Theft Auto and what have you that people could do over and over again, like Rob Banks or what have you. Uh, so the first thing I did in this respect when I'm looking at the missions is again to do a smaller version of totems. And these drawings are like, copied the heck out of, you know, Will Eisner and Jordy Burnett and anything you can get your hands on. But re really try and sum up what you're trying to design a comic book page uh, is my chosen method. But some way in which people can encapsulate straight away, uh, you know, what this whole thing is about. So this is just three random missions, uh, uh, me trying to tell the team uh, or even clarify for myself uh, what these different missions were about. Um, you'd have a mission like Michael's Revenge, which uh, obviously it's the famous scene where Michael shoots Salazzo and the police chief in the restaurant, but how the heck do I incorporate my player into that? And that was an easy one, because if you remember from the movie, Clemenza uh, at, uh, gets the gun placed in the, in the cistern, you know, before the kill. So that was a really easy thing for me to get my player to do, considering Clemenza was the player's uh, tutor and, and capo at this point. Um, but again, it's like, what do I do before and after this mission? How can I get Michael to this mission and how can I get him out of it? Now, a lot of it may have gone into kind of, you know, shootouts and suddenly there's more people in the restaurant than you remember from the movie. But the goal with us was always, you had team members coming up and going, I remember that guy. I remember that scene from the movie. I remember that guy in the movie and they weren't there. We, we just created them. We would put those people in the restaurant. Um, I, I went through the book, so obviously look, trying to gather your sources. And, and these comic book pages give everything the same weight. So doing a comic book page of a Michael classic Godfather scene, doing a, a scene that came out of my own head or a scene that came out of the book, give them all an equal weight and started to create, you know, the design actually uh, had some cohesion about it. So, I, so getting a little bit of uh, uh, information about Bonacera's daughter and what happened to the thugs that beat her up, afterwards, you know, and again, that gives you a perfect uh, in point. Um, working on something that was more crucial, which became our kind of tr trailer and our very first launch and everything, uh, The Dawn is Dead, which was basically uh, when uh, they shot Brando, uh, they shot Don Vito, and uh, he didn't die, of course. Um, but again, how to start with that kernel of a scene, that idea, that waypoint in your head, uh, and how to develop around that. But as long as you nail that point, Brando still runs across the road, gets shot, Fredo is still crying by the side of the car, and then take it from there. Um, and, it, and, and that drawing I did there actually shows you the way we kind of grafted our world onto their world. So there's uh, Genko olive oil from the movie, and that was actually a movie still. And then I just went, quick, and put my barbershop on there, and that's where my player is. So he's in the barbershop, he sees it from exactly the same viewpoint. Um, uh, and then he uh, interacts with that scene. And again, a, a completely new mission. Uh, we actually designed this for, um, for a charity. It was weird. We had a kid come in uh, uh, for, a, for a charity cause and uh, help us design this, which is a really great experience. So it wasn't, there wasn't as much swearing in, the, in this mission as, uh, uh, as I've put in every Jimmy Can mission. Um, uh, but again, you know, you just give it equal weight and bring it in and make it part of the experience. And of course we had five families that, that we had all these extra ex experiences we could attach to them, the Tatayas, the Cuneos, you know, the Stracci, all those guys. Um, so my approach to then designing an open world, and again it was about a functionality of scale. Uh, it wasn't about this endless driving experience, or at least I wished it wasn't. Uh, didn't want that. My mantra was get out and walk. Uh, I wanted to focus really clearly on areas of interest. I didn't want you to be driving, you know, forever doing nothing. Uh, uh, more about that later. Uh, but I wanted to create a world that supported the narrative, uh, that supported the drive of the Godfather movie and all the, the, way, the, the, the stories that I'm telling that are weaving in and out and meeting at each of those sort of flashpoints. Um, so, trying to figure out what the Corleones, New York City, meant. Uh, you know, again, thinking down the line, what 
it's going to be like to play. And this is where I got into my concept of playgrounds, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but also the things that connected the map together, like racket chains, how things, how the whole map was connected. But primarily, what the hell was it that that I needed to see that made me believe that that was the Corleone's New York City of 1945, 1955? We never actually got to decade of change, but ideally, it would have the world would have changed over those ten years as well. Uh, uh, new buildings, you know, etc. But we didn't get to that. So we started analyzing the maps. Uh, and I started to draw these crazy world maps um, uh, and start to analyze areas like Brooklyn and uh, Little Italy to see where there had been experiences from the movie. Actually, this was the first map I came up with. Somebody told me, don't ever draw New York, New York sideways again because you have no idea where that is. Um, but, um, and I never did, you know, you, you took the, the, the politics seriously at EA. Um, but, uh, so this is my map, uh, it's a giant wall chart, again, it's a totem that people could gather around and laugh at or, you know, ideally really get into. Um, and it uh, allowed me to kind of highlight in big words and buildings and that sort of thing where the actual experience in the movie had occurred and how I could start to connect those together to make a really cohesive world and then fill in the gaps. It was my philosophy on Tomb Raider and it's my philosophy now, is create those moments, those waypoints, and then fill in the gaps. Uh, ideally not with long brown corridors. Uh, but, you know, just more analysis, you know, where these locations were. We had to make some tough decisions. We did do, we did fly to LA for a mission, but that was completely it was just something we couldn't, you couldn't do without that, the, the Wolf's Mission uh, with the horse's head. Um, uh, and it wasn't successful, but things like the toll booth, where would you integrate these in? And I was a little too anal about this at the time, so I really wanted to be realistic. I wanted to be exactly where Clemenza says, you know, uh, leave the gun, take the cannoli, or whatever, those bull rushes or those reeds. I wanted that view of the Statue of Liberty to be exactly the same. Um, but I, I kind of learned over time, I, I mean, this was a, like a four-year game, basically, uh, you know, you have to make a lot of compromises. Uh, just, but you get the feel, you get the effect of it. Um, so, initially, I wanted to be very, very realistic. So, again, a lot of research always helps. Uh, vintage skyscrapers of the day um, employ a much better architect than myself to come in and do some real drawings and get these things built properly. Uh, you know, identify, again, on a budget, you know, there are five million skyscrapers in New York, pick the best 20, and pick the 20 that fit with your experience that you're gonna see in the most views. Uh, and again, I think it's a golden rule that kind of applies for anything, you know. Everyone always talks about branching stories, and we chatted about that last night, about people are seeing 10% of your content sometimes in, in some of those games. Uh, how can we create stories that snap back into place, that drag you back into the, the meat of the narrative, but make you feel like you haven't been limited in your choices? And that was the whole point about Quantic Dream and Heavy Rain and, and the sort of stuff in Fahrenheit, the sort of stuff we did there where, where we only build the really the, the main narrative and we let you feel like you're, you're snapping out to other experiences and then we snap you right back. So a lot of detail and again, just working through a whole series of crazy drawings and maps. Uh, this is how the map evolved. Just I thought you might find this interesting. You know, you start to see the areas that really get populated the areas that really come to the fore, where the families are assigned uh, in that one, uh, and then how you break down each individual area. Uh, and then when you become a Ponzi creative writer like me, how you can come up and just put a nice little felt tip mark on things and people change stuff for you. That was great. Uh, and let's see, space bar. And those maps became proper professional maps. They took them out of my hands and started to do it properly. And I think the legacy I left here, which is a lesson I learned, was I tried to be way too realistic about New York streets because they were all grid, right? And a driving experience on a grid is just no fun at all. So you'll notice that the bits of the map that I didn't detail out, uh, I think Prima have covered it really well. This was the Prima map in the uh, Hints Guide. You'll see these kind of chicanes and all these S-bends and curves, and it's kind of this wild part of New York that doesn't exist. Uh, but that was, that was the compromise solution to that. Um, how am I doing on time? 20 minutes, something? I don't know. Playgrounds. So getting a, get, moving a grain in. So obviously, in any project where you're thinking about story, and, and I mean, I'm 
probably referring mostly to games that have some kind of narrative. So I'm not talking about abstract, I'm not talking about Tetris, although there's a narrative to Tetris, um, uh, possibly. Um, but, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with your story structure, you're either adopting a license or you're coming up with your own, uh, you're figuring out how those things get integrated, you're trying to be a catalyst and sell those ideas to people, uh, to clients, to your team, to, to anybody that will listen. Um, and then when it comes down to working into the grain of that, working through the map, uh, trying to figure out how this gameplay is going to work in these spaces. Um, so this is, uh, again, my concept of playgrounds. So first I baffle the team with tons of really obscure architectural phrases like, uh, what was it, offensible space, and I don't know where I heard that, and the modular, and uh, term, the Terminator was all based on the modular for me. It was a beautiful synthesis of a world and a person, you know, and that's actually what I talk about in my other lectures. Um, in this case, I'm trying to find this perfect grain for New York, for this Godfather experience, where players can go into these buildings and just have a lot of fun. And actually, I don't even know if it shows in the, in the final version so much, but I ended up designing 45 different modular kits for the game and then just launching them and letting people put the pieces together. Uh, we ended up with seven, I think, in the game. But I don't, you'd hardly notice. I mean, there still feels like there's a lot of variety. Um, but basically, coming up with a system where I imagined that if you could design, and this is again why the scale of the game doesn't really matter, if I can design a unit, or a hero unit, uh, as a friend here is designing a really beautiful, uh, well, you'll probably not be my friend after this because I'm giving your secrets away. Um, if I can design this unit, let's say it's Lara Croft and it's a module around her, she can jump two spaces, she can leap three spaces, she can climb that way, wh whatever number of spaces. If I can create this module around her, this matrix, uh, or around a building, then just, I just reason that by virtue that if I start to expand that, that I'm just multiplying the experience and I'm really hopefully not diluting it. So, so here was a whole bunch of examples of how I'm pushing squares around and, and the easy sh shapes to make and how I was going to end up making warehouses and uh, you know, restaurants and nightclubs and shops and grocery stores and, and everything that became part of it. Um, so here's a few modules uh, that we were working on, me and my architect friends. Uh, we were ganging up on everybody else because we were two architects. We talked the secret architectural language. Uh, uh, and uh, this restaurant, for example, on the right-hand side is, um, was the, was we worked out the exact restaurant where Luca Brazzi was killed. Uh, and just from the movie, how that restaurant was designed and built. And then we basically used it as a module and flipped it around and, and created like, you know, 20 restaurants in the game that were based, or bars that were based on the same principle. Um, and then in the game, I suppose, you know, just range of experiences, you know, boats in the harbor and then the interiors of the rooms and look at all this interface crap that's around them, excuse me again. Uh, uh, but but really just to try and get this uh, playable experience uh, where, uh, where you um, take a unit of playability in a way and you expand it to a building and you put two of those together and make a bigger building and put three of those together and make a warehouse, change the textures. Uh, it, actually what really happened was it ended up when the serious environmental designers came on board, I'd done everything too small because you know, if you remember Lara Cross World, like, everything looked great until you put her in a bedroom. And then she had a giant toilet and a really huge blocky bed and everything was way out of whack. Well, the same thing here was that I'd been so precise in my architectural details that corridors were like normal corridors, you know, and uh, so everything, you know, got fleshed out to game proportion uh, uh, based on the actual movement radius of, of my character. Um, and again, just related to this then, how do you link this in a cohesive environmental narrative, uh, the racket system, how do you connect the stories through each of these experiences? So as I play and take over one restaurant that's Cuneo, how does that lead me to want to know where those, uh, that illegal liquor came from? The warehouse. When I get to the warehouse, where did that come from? The docks, you know, and how to create all these connections through the map so hopefully you're not just wandering aimlessly. But as I can prove with Skyrim, there's nothing wrong with wandering aimlessly sometimes. Um, and then we got really physical with it. We created this kind of board game map room where, um, again, this is where um, 
I wanted this living world, and uh, the guy that actually wasn't living until the guy from the Sim City came, uh, my great friend Mike Perry came in and started to make it living because he, he knew how to do it. Um, so we created these maps, and, and Mike was driving this where, you know, they'd put the maps out, they'd put different clumps of people, and they'd work out their behaviors, and they'd move them around on the map, and it just basically filled this room. But again, it was this kind of totem where all the designers fed off, and they all kind of circled around and really got immersed with that. Um, there's just another shot of the map room. Um, now, character immersion. Uh, and this was, this was, again, relating this to not necessarily just working with famous actors or anything like that there, but how are your actors supporting the story? Uh, you know, their believability. You have to do a ton of research and all these things, as, as all us designers know, but, but how do you make something that's just more than a, you know, gunfight game or a racing game or, you know, we, we developed this thing called Face to Face, which was our version of Hand to Hand. We even had the nice F2F, um, which was the fact that, and what Francis Ford Coppola, uh, who initially gave us access to everything, it was great. I got to go to his archives and find all those hidden scenes that I could put into the game. Um, but, but basically, uh, you know, he accused us of turning The Godfather uh, when he saw some rough demos of, you know, there's a lot of shooting and driving and crashing and stuff in it. I mean, it's a game, right? Um, but it turned out that when you play that game, uh, that's not how you're going to succeed. If you go all kind of Jimmy Cagney, white heat, you know, top of the world man on this game, it's just not going to happen for you. You need to negotiate, bribe, talk, shake the guy up a bit. And it's actually turned out that the game was primarily about not killing people, uh, you know, to, for you to make any progress. Um, so we got James Caan, Robert Duvall, and Marlon Brando back. There wasn't a lot of the original cast left who was still alive. Uh, that's the trouble with working with an old license. Uh, Pacino wouldn't do it. He said that he, the Godfather, that was his legacy, and he wasn't going to change that. And then, of course, he went off and did the Scarface game because that was mu much less important to him. Um, we, uh, Jimmy Cam was easy. He's still sunny. He says it gets him better seats in restaurants. Uh, he's still a very scary man and a lovely, lovely man. I remember when I did the script for Jimmy Cam and I'll try and keep this clean. Uh, my, my producer came to me and said, Phil, there's way too many F words per page here. This is terrible, you know. We are going for an 18 light scene, but uh, so he actually gave me instructions like take out two F words per page. Uh, so I duly edited the whole script. And of course, we came to the recording session, Jimmy can put them all back in, and worse. <coughs> I mean, it jokes in Italian about his privates, all, all sorts of things that he, he, he actually won, a, he was nominated, he didn't win, he, he was nominated for a gaming Oscar for his performance, he was brilliant. And his attitude to this, which is interesting in the contrast to the way I'll tell you about later with Brando and Duval, um, his, his thing about this was, he said, I love the idea that my, my kids can play with me after I'm dead. Uh, uh, and it was just, uh, so let me show you a scene that he's in, which is really funny because it's a classic scene that I've tinkered with and tried to figure out how to put my uh, hero into the scene with Jimmy Cannon and Robert Duvall, add a bit of dialogue at the end. You will see some of the worst exposition dialogue in the world from Duvall, and I think a lot of it's his delivery, it's not my writing, but it was a point in the game where you had to promote the player and you had to announce, so this was something where it's really gamey. But then you write a few fun lines for Jimmy Can, and I, I, ideally it just makes it all right in the end. But again, it's topping and tailing a favorite scene, a famous scene. Um, I remember the first time we did the Luca Brazzi murder, and it's plain and obvious that there's only three people in that room. I think uh, Bruno Tattaglia, uh, Salazzo, is it, or the bar, I can't remember now, and Luca Brazzi. And the very first scene we did had the player looking in the window from the outside, and when we showed it to the team, you have this murder this classic scene and then you see this little head peeping through the window. I think it actually still does that. Uh, so we got laughed out of the room uh, that time. Uh, so this one I think is a bit more successful. Let me show you this. Uh, it may need to be volumed up a wee bit. No. No, 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 no more. Not this time, Consigliere. No more meetings, no more discussions. That's no more lots of tricks. You give him one message. I want Salazzo. If not, it's all out war. We go to the mattresses, all right? Father wouldn't want to hear this. This is business, not personal, Sonny. They shot my father. 
That's business? Your ass. Even the shooting of your father was business, not personal, son. Well, the business will have to suffer, right? Listen, Tom, do me a favor. Please, no more advice on how to patch things up. Just, just help me try to win this thing, okay? Hey, son, we'd like you to become an associate to the Corleone. Exposition. We can use a man of your abilities representing us out on the streets. The point I want to stress to you, though, if you're going to be one of our associates, is the power of negotiation, okay? Even with the way things are now, especially in times like this, use your head. A lawyer with his briefcase can steal more than 100 men with guns. Hey, kid, listen. Believe me, if you ever have 100 guys with guns on your side, whatever you do, don't trade them in for some fucking lawyer. <laughs> And, and the nice thing about this, in a way, was that, um, was that all the cinematics uh, were obviously in-game, uh, the same engine that we were using for the in-game real-time stuff, but it inserted your player character, and you'll see this in a minute, you could customize your own character to... But everyone made them look like that, basically. But, um, um, but uh, Tom, Hagen, uh, Tom Hagen, Robert Duvall, when he was asked why he did the Godfather game, he simply did this. Uh, he was brilliant, though. I mean, he was great. We had to re-record every single line that they did in the movie, too, uh, because they're, they're, they're so much older now that their intonation, their tone had changed a lot, deepened a lot. Um, and Brando, I, got, I had the pleasure and the, and the honor of uh, uh, writing, writing the script for, Brand, for Marlon Brando, Don Vito, in the game, and I feel like he'd be turning in his grave if he knew that the last script he ever performed was written by this fat Northern Irish non-professional game writer. Uh, um, but we sat in his house in Mulholland Drive for four hours. He was very sick. He died two weeks later, which was incredibly tragic. Uh, we recorded everything, and after he told me off a few times and tried to get more money out of me, uh, which is crazy, you know, I don't have any money. Um, and he, it's funny, because one of the game commodities, and you always have this thing, especially in all this horrible gamification freemium world that we now live in, uh, the commodity in our game was respect. You earned respect, you lost respect, you gained enough respect, you got promoted. And so a lot of my script was, quite rightly, about respect. Brando, or what, and basically every time you see Don Vito in the game, it's like a reward, because he doesn't actually go on missions with you and shoot it out, you know, with the Tatalias. He basically rewards you with a pat on the back and some man-hugging. Um, and uh, so Brando said to me, uh, and I won't do an impersonation because I'm really terrible, but he said to me, this respect, you know, this respect, it's like a rash on my ear, you know, because he was hearing it so much. But he was angling me until we finally became friends about two hours in, uh, and it was a fantastic experience. Um, we couldn't use so much of what he generated because I'd written a Don Vito from, you know, from 1945 to 55, so it had the younger Don Vito, it had some flashbacks of Don Vito, and he just couldn't manage it, it was too old. Uh, but we could use him in the hospital scenes and the older scenes. So here's a little bit here. Um, this was the other joy of doing a property like this because this is an initiation scene, which there's nothing written in the book, there's nothing shown in the movie, but we researched how the, you become a made man and how it works. We actually designed this 30-minute sequence. It was crazy, and of course, we had to make it two minutes. So as long as we realized, as long as you got a few of the nice classy words in from Don Vito, a lot of man-hugging you'll see in this, uh, so if you're upset by man-hugging, don't. And your player, basically all the people who've been friends with you in the game are inserted into that cinematic to this point. There is nothing more important to a man than his family. These men, these men of honor, they too are my family. La familia Corleone. I now invite you to be reborn as one of us. Yes, Godfather. You are now one of our qualified men. A lot of kissing. Do you only need qualification? Please, introduce yourself to your brother. Hey, Acha. Congratulations. Good for you, kid. You're done. Glad you're on our side. Yeah, you see those polygons really flex there. Uh, and I think, again, 
the takeaway from this to a certain extent is Again, the balance, this is the, car the cast, you know, of, of heights and size. They were pretty much all the same height model, female, male, and just the way we worked it. Um, but it's achieving that integrity of, you know, if you're integrating a license or, uh, you know, making sure you're supporting cast and your whole cast work together as one. Um, the beauty of this, again, was like, it was like a paint by numbers, how to design uh, this sort of game with hierarchies and families and stuff was that every family did have a hierarchy So all I had to do was fill in the boxes put in the people that were in the movie and just fill in the blanks uh, You know, so that's why we generated all these mysterious Corleone soldiers you never saw in the movie, but uh, become important um, The other thing that became really important was at that time there was a lot of this business about well the cinematics aren't gameplay and I want everything to be interactive and and, and some games nowadays have, have taken that to, to, to a really great level where you really feel like, well, he Heavy Rain, you, you really feel like you're playing. Um, and um, it's escaped me now, but uh, uh, Drake's Fortune. Uh, exactly. Uh, Uncharted uh, really does a beautiful job of that. Uh, what we discovered in this game was that we would let the player design as goony a character as they wanted. And you'll see a few of them here. Uh, but we have a t had a technique where you integrated those with the cinematics, which is really nice because it was always your guy with them in the game. And you couldn't beat that experience. Like when Sonny, before Sonny dies, he's like your brother. Uh, and you're going around town with him, kicking ass and causing trouble. And he gets a lot of chance to swear and, you know, all that stuff. And you're right alongside him enjoying his swearing. And uh, uh, it allowed you to really bond into those characters from the movie. And by the end, I think, you know, hate the ones you're supposed to hate and love the ones you're supposed to love and feel sad when, when we don't tell you when the Tolbooth scene is coming with Sony. It just happens. It's like in the, the fourth in a string of really great, well, supposedly really great Sony missions, and then boom, he's dead. Uh, you know, when they lead Tessio away in the famous scene, um, what happened after that? That's another thing we developed because you felt a lot of sympathy for Tessio. And at the last minute, we got Abe Vigoda. I don't know if you familiar with him, he's much more famous in America. I think it was, is it Cheers or whatever he was in? But he, um, he was like 95 or something. He was the oldest of all the actors and he was amazing. Uh, the guy was, he just recreated his performance like that. And we actually ended up writing ahead of him and for as long as we thought maybe he'd die off too, you know, so we, but we kept adding because he was so good. And you never let go of an opportunity like that. If you feel something's rolling and Again, something I talked about with a lot of Irish developers last night. Uh, if you have a, it's great to have a set of rules and a set of guidelines and frameworks for the city and frameworks for the story. But if you feel something's working and it's an exception to the rule, roll with it. If it's you know if it's getting you somewhere, because then you'll just develop a whole new rule set. Um, and the communication. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> with me there talking incessantly, drawing incessantly. I've never finished a drawing in my life. Every single drawing I do is process. Don't do any presentation drawings at all. I just try to make the process drawings look nice so people will actually read them. Uh, I do have a technique of every script I write, I put a mention of an elephant in there uh, so I know if people have been reading it. They'll go, this is great, but what's with the elephant? And I'm, they're my best friend. You know, it's a really good technique. Um, but we did a lot of sharing techniques, a lot of ways to get all of these people involved in this. Uh, and on the wall design was a thing that we actually started and had it grow and actually ended up calculating, you know, the impact it had and what uh, formulating it was. But th the whole of EA at that point, our whole floor just became this spreading mass of totemic drawings and on the wall designs and people were pinning money to this, thank you. Uh, some of it was fake, uh, but really every area was explored until it ran out or it hit the ceiling and then you had a decision, should I stop doing that because it's hit the ceiling or should I stop doing that because it's no good for the game? Um, not serious about that one of course. Um, but then again, there's the, um, there's the world, uh, there's the on the wall design, the way it was broken down so you could explain it to some executive and they knew you weren't just messing around. Um, Finally on this, the best thing of all was the fake strategy guide. Uh, and again, there's so many parallels to what you can do with this on a smaller team with a smaller effect. It's, it's anticipate what people are going to say about your game, anticipate the app store reviews, write them, 
uh, uh, you know, get your t all your team members to write them. Uh, the fake strategy guide not only was a great selling tool for us, but a great way of encapsulating, well, where the hell is the fun in this game and what is going to work? And I knew then the driving wasn't going to work, but there you go. Um, after The Godfather, for me personally, weirdly, as a Northern Irish guy, uh, I became the go-to guy for gangster stuff. I don't know, they must have thought I was Italian. I did... Uh, I wrote uh, uh, Tony Montana uh, for, for MTV, Cribs. I wrote the Cribs episode where he shows him around his mansion. Uh, I did such uh, freemium games as uh, Big Time Gangsta. Uh, and then again, Contract Killer was, uh, I mean, you know, that would be then my whole next slideshow, if we had another R, um, is where we're going. But, but um, yeah, if all else fails, it's back to the whiteboard. Um, the way I'm working now, obviously, criticizing and chastising freemium and, and gamification and things like that, and all those terms that are, I mean, I never, I have no names for my rules and stuff, uh, but Greg and I working on fairy magic within life size. Uh, we're trying to do augmented reality and we're trying to take it step by step at the time. Um, uh, it's in a, whole, a whole new process again. It's the first thing I've ever owned in my entire design life, which, is, which also feels important. I think locks you into you know, that ethic of, of where the money's coming from, where it's going, and you know, what we're actually designing. Um, this was a design I did for uh, Everything and Nothing. Uh, that game I must have designed four or five times, but this was like an overnight uh, whiteboard. You can see the pens there, so you can see the scale of the thing. Uh, and really, I know that the cleaner was gonna wipe that off that night. But I just wanted to put that up there, have the team see it. And, and the really interesting thing is how polarizing things like that can be. If you look like you know what you're doing, or you look like you can do something, or even a semi-good drawing, or a bit of writing, or a story that gets from a beginning through a middle to an end, you have half the team are like kind of jealous or bitter that they didn't get to do that, or it wasn't working in the normal process. You have to be very, very careful how you put these things out there. But then you'll also get half of your team that are wildly excited that something's happening and they'll scribble on the board and there was, there's ones that are putting the rude words about me on there, but there's also the ones that are uh, adding to it and changing things. And